There is an incredible power that is unleashed when you don't quite get what you want, yet find a way to remain happy. And today what I'm going to be talking about is the power of non-attainment. <laughs> and there's, there's a grand irony in this, because if we fail happily and, and we fail effectively, in fact, we gain more self-confidence, we have greater self-esteem, we have more connection to each other, to the universe. In fact, we become more successful. Earlier this year, myself and three other individuals decided that we were going to row from Descar, Senegal to Miami, Florida. Yeah. <laughs> and we called this the CWF, Africa to the Americas Expedition. And we did it in a boat that looked like this. Your sleeping quarters are pretty small. It's about the size of a sheet of plywood. And you share it with one other person. Right? <laughs> a six foot six, 220 pound, bearded snuggle bear. Right? <laughs> you should see his jammies. <laughs> and on this boat, you're responsible for rowing 12 hours a day. On top of rowing 12 hours a day, you're also responsible for conducting scientific experiments on human psychology, on the human physiology, on human circadian rhythms, as well as the state of our planet's oceans. On top of this, you are also maintaining a blog. You have educational curriculum that you're delivering to kiddies in America and Canada. And you also phone up and talk to the media every once in a while. <laughs> and it, you know, it was a lot of work, right? And I do realize that you can fly over the ocean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But we deliberately took the slow route across the ocean because we knew that we would learn more by taking the slow route. And I would like to encourage each and every one of you here today and watching on the internet, take the slow route across. And the slow route changed drastically for us on the morning of day 73 of our ocean row. I had laid down in the cabin for a nap. My partner, Pat, who is going to be my sleeping buddy. Uh, he, he came into the cabin. Pat's a, he's an avalanche control guy. Uh, grew up in Connecticut. He's crawling in when a couple of funky waves come and they start flooding our cabin. Before I could say anything, the boat had flipped upside down and Pat was in the cabin with me. I push him out, I say, go Pat, go, go Pat, go. And all of a sudden I was in there, I was in this four foot by four foot by eight foot cabin, rapidly filling with water upside down and I had no air. I was looking around, and I see the floor, which is now the ceiling, and there's an air pocket there. So I go, <gasps> I pop up, I grab a breath of water, and I see a blue light below me, the hatch. I think, do this properly, right? <laughs> <laughs> Take another breath, and I dive under, swim through, and there's all these cables hanging. I come out, I pop up out of the water, and I look around, and I, I see Pat, I see Jordan, I see Marcus, my other crewmates. We say, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? We go, we deploy our emergency life raft. We tie it to the boat. We put on our emergency beacons, and we look at one another. We failed, right? And this drastically contrasts an experience I personally had four years ago. I won the Olympics. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now let me tell you, there is no feeling of success like it. You cross the finish line after five and a half minutes of grueling pain, and the first thing that goes through your mind is, I just won the Olympics, right? <laughs> the, thing, the next thing that goes through your mind is that I just won the Olympics with my eight closest friends in the world, right? And I did it in spandex, right? <laughs> and we, we, we learned a lot. We learned a lot on this Olympic journey. And one of the things I learned the most on going to the Olympics and being successful at the Olympics was a lesson on failure. And if you turn your eyes to that middle guy, that big, bald Viking with the sunglasses, arms up in the air, that guy's name is Jake Wetzel. And before Jake Wetzel showed up at the training center, 
Before Jake Wetzel showed up at the training center, I was the fastest starboard in Canada. Then Jake started to beat me. Jerk. <laughs> and the first thing that happened when Jake started to beat me, he was faster, this egoic shield went up around me. I didn't want anything to do with Jake. You know, Jake was an idiot. I wanted to beat him. I wanted to confront him. I wanted to beat him on every curve. And then eventually, I had this chance where I was able to step back and say, wait a second. Even though we're competing against one another, we're on the same team, right? I can learn something from him. So I invite Jake out for lunch, and we're sitting over this pile of bagels and a dozen eggs, right? We eat as, <laughs> yeah, we, we eat as much as a five-person family does every day. And I ask him, Jake, what's your secret to success? You know, how are you so successful? And Jake looks at me, he's this, you know, like I said, a big, bald Viking, and he speaks with a bit of a stutter, and he's a close talker, and he's like, I, 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 I seek failure. I, what, come on, are you serving me a cone for like lunch too, right? Uh, like what, what are you trying to say, Jake? And Jake said, I seek failure. And he went to explain it to me. He said, every week we train from Monday through Saturday, and I pick one workout every week where I will willingly push myself through my known limit, and I will embrace failure. And in fact, my body will fail on me. And for the rest of the week, I will know what this limit is. I will know what my limit is, and I will hover below it. And in fact, the greatest point of growth occurs right below your limit. And I looked at him, and I said, genius. Right? <laughs> And I believe that you know, each and every single one of us has a capacity bubble, a capacity to achieve, to find success, to find fulfillment, to find happiness in life. And we can choose to stay in the center of our capacity bubble and slowly let that bubble shrink. Or we can hover around the edges of our capacity bubble and let that bubble grow. And if you are impatient and you want that bubble to grow as fast as possible, what should you do? You should be right at the edge of your capacity bubble. And how do you know where your edge is? You fail. But you don't just fail, you're happy about it. We'll get to that in a bit. I've had my uh, share of success and failures in life, and I've realized that you can fail and be happy or fail and be sad. You can succeed and be happy or you can succeed and be sad. And I went to the Olympics in 2004, and we didn't win the Olympics. We finished fifth. We were expected to win. I remember crossing the finish line with my teammates and sobbing, right? Eight big guys all crying in spandex, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, I remember winning the world championships for the first time and having the surprising realization that I was depressed after being heavyweight champion of the world. What is that, right? I went to the Olympics and I won, and that was just pure awesome. <laughs> and obviously I went to the Atlantic Ocean, and we didn't succeed, yet we were happy. And as I've traveled around and as I've learned more about life, I've actually come to believe that most of life actually occurs in this bottom corner of the graph, right? And seeing as today we're here talking about emergence, let me present to you the theory that a most emergence occurs in the bottom left-hand corner of this box. So, let's talk about the happy fail. <laughs> in fact, your brain is smarter when it is happier. Right? Brain research has come up to show that you're better at math, you're better at language, you're better at communication when you are happy. And failure is inevitably going to come towards you. So if you find a way to be happy in the midst of failure, in fact, you will find bigger ideas. And now picture all of us here today. We're, we're stumbling around in the world, and we're setting big goals, but we're not quite getting them, but yet we're happy in the moment, right? We're selfishly kind of going and saying, I, I want to do this. I'm going to get it. Oh, no, I didn't get that, but wait a second. You know, look at all I've accomplished. I'm still a little bit happy, right? 
And I think a funny thing happens when we have a bunch of happy failures setting big goals and going for those goals and making the best with what comes. Emergence occurs, right? You strive to go into that best neighborhood in town, but you can't quite afford it. So you go into this other neighborhood. And guess what? You make that neighborhood better. And a bunch of other people have that same experience. And all of a sudden, before you know it, that neighborhood comes out as the neighborhood to be, right? (laughs) And you can think of countless metaphors like that. (laughs) And my father taught me this. My father is an investor and an economist. And one of the things that my father said to me, my father said, Adam, you can do anything in the world you want. Just be the best at it. Because there's always a niche for the best. Right? <laughs> and, and my goal in life is to be the best happy failure there is. And like a good happy failure, I was attracted to this other happy failure, and his name is Jordan Hansen. And uh, I met Jordan Hansen down in San Francisco. We were doing this dory rowing race. We rowed out under the Golden Gate Bridge, and then we came back in and we had this barbecue. And it was a bit of rowing love, because Jordan had rowed across the North Atlantic in 2006, and he had heard that you know, I'd gone to the Olympics and won an Olympic medal. And so our eyes caught across the barbecue. We walked towards one another. And, and we, were, we were instantly connected. You know, when you meet a person who you, who, with, in whom you see your own soul, you know, that was Jordan and myself. We just had that instant connection. And Jordan tell, told me about his adventure. In fact, he felt like he had some failure on his row because his crew going from New York to England did not pack enough food. And in fact, they each lost 20 to 45 pounds a person by the time they made it to the other side. And now they've got a very successful weight loss program. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, (laughs) it was. And I remember Jordan, and I remember looking into Jordan's eyes right before we climbed into the emergency life raft. Come back to the ocean with me. We're in the Bermuda Triangle. We're bobbing around. We've been trying to rewrite this boat. We're tying ropes on it. We're hauling on it. We're singing. We're pulling. We're trying to rewrite the boat, and it's not happening. We've been in the water for about three hours. I look over at Jordan, and Jordan's turning purple. Hypothermia. I look at Jordan and say, we've got to get into the life raft. You're turning purple. And Jordan looks at me and says, I look good in purple. (laughs) <laughs> we, we go to the life raft and we climb in. And now picture, it's the size of this little red dot. We climb in, all right? We're big guys and we're kind of sitting there. It's like a, I don't know what you want to call it, a kiddie pool with a tent tarp on top of it. And we're sitting there waiting for someone to show up. And I remember when the Coast Guard did show up. They were flying overhead five hours after we flipped in a C-130, The first thing Pat said, he started to scream, we're going to be okay, (laughs) right? And uh, Marcus and Jordan are Americans, Um, or Pat and Jordan are the Americans, Marcus and myself are the Canadians, and as soon as us two Canadians saw the U.S. Coast Guards coming, you know what we did? We just started chanting, USA, USA, (laughs) USA, and so here we are, we're sitting in this little life raft, and we're waiting for for someone to show up, and we, we're having a conversation, right? And we're saying, well, we failed. Now we know that we're not going to do kind of the biggest failure in life, which is, I suppose, dying before your time, <laughs> right? So what are we, what are we actually going to do here? And we came to the decision that we were actually going to make the most of this opportunity. And so as we're sitting, we're waiting, we, uh, th- we eventually get in contact with the, the, the plane that's flying overhead. We pull up one of our radio transmitters, and it's a guy from, from northern Florida. And he's like, we got the MV Hygiene coming to pick y'all up. <laughs> and Jordan looks over at me and says, oh, I think that's a clean boat. <laughs> right? and, 
Marcus looks over and he's like, I think it's full of dental hygienists, right? <laughs> but it was, a, it was a big boat uh, full of a Filipino crew. And uh, they dropped a ladder, a rope ladder, clanging off the side of the boat, five stories up. And we go and we grab on it and we climb up and we get onto this boat. And we have some time to collect our, our thoughts before we hit the media storm. And we decide that we are going to take advantage of this. We decide that we're going to take advantage of this, this moment. And so the media calls us up and they said, you just slipped in the middle of the ocean. Aren't you disappointed we, you failed? And what we said was, no, we actually had an incredible time. When we were off the coast of Africa, we were stampeded by thousands of dolphins. They were jumping over our bow and they were screaming, right? <laughs> I was 200 feet away from a giant humpback whale that completely breached and belly flopped beside me, and my bones vibrated. I've never felt anything like that. I got to swim over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I had flying squid come and hit me, and I ate them. <laughs> the ocean is beautiful. <laughs> and... <clears throat> When I think of the Atlantic Ocean, that is what I think of. I think of the beautiful things that we saw, of the magical experiences we shared. And so my challenge to each and every single one of you here today is think about that big goal in your life and go out. Embrace the power of non-attainment. Go seek failure. And P.S., we recovered our boat and I recovered my wedding ring but that's a story for another time. Thank you. <laughs>